just thanks for inviting me to the conference. Um, I think this is my third year speaking. Uh, I missed last year, but uh, I was here the year before. And um, during that session, uh, my team and I had been working on some prototypes for uh, what I now call a cognitive IVR system, but it also enabled a, a agent user, uh, agent assist use case. And um, so this, this presentation is kind of an update to that. Um, that was, uh, we built the prototype at the time, we were kind of turning that into a product, and this is two years later, and uh, that's been productized. We also have a, a software as a service offering as well. Uh, and, you know, I learned a lot along the way. I'm going to talk about some of the challenges we ran into and just kind of give an update to that, that discussion. So, um, so what's going on with customer service today? We're definitely seeing a chatbot re revolution. Uh, there was a good discussion yesterday about RCS and AI, and, and uh, we're seeing the same thing at IBM. Lots of uh, enterprises are deploying chatbots, and uh, even though they're becoming more and more popular, uh, voice is still the primary channel that people use to communicate with customer support. Um, you know, there's email, other things, but we, uh, the numbers are debatable, but uh, in terms of a cost for a large cus uh, uh, contact center, it's very expensive. Um, you know, uh, some of these numbers are debatable. Six to ten dollars per call is some of the estimates I've seen for a, uh, a live agent call. Uh, that encompasses training and everything involved, the salary. So it's, it's a very expensive thing when you're talking to someone on the other end of the line. So... Um, Certainly, we see automation and AI as uh, helping with that problem. Uh, we also think that AI can help with wait time reductions, improve customer satisfaction, and uh, make it easier uh, to access internal documentation. Um, you know, there's lots of, lots of unstructured data uh, within an enterprise that the companies would like to surface to their customers if they can in different ways. So. So uh, from my perspective, I see kind of four major ways that AI is being infused right now into contact centers. There's certainly a lot more going on, I think, uh, at the network layer, and I'm not really talking about that. Um, but AI can handle calls uh, that previously only humans can handle. So we see kind of, uh, you know, the easy calls, uh, the very prescriptive kinds of calls that contact center agents handle today, we feel like can be automated and we're seeing some success there. Uh, we also feel like we can reduce uh, call hold times with live agents through agent assist. So, uh, you know, this is, I would say we're seeing this more with larger customers that have really large contact centers. They want to introduce AI into the contact center, but they, uh, they're not re ready to hand over their calls to an automated agent. So they, they want to figure out how to assist their live agents. Um, you know, AI is great at, at converting a lot of unstructured data into something that's consumable. Um, we have a lot of tools at IBM for that. There's all kinds of tools out there for doing that. So we, we, we think this is another area that can be helpful both to, to live agents as well as to customers directly. Um, and then we see AI kind of being used uh, in, more by supervisors across that are looking at trends across their whole contact center. If you have a situation going on that uh, is negatively impacting your, your enterprise, you want to find out about it as quickly as possible to, to mitigate the problems, and, and you can use AI to do that as well. So I, I put this together to kind of show, you know, at least from a flow, how we see uh, AI being engaged in the contact center. Uh, when the call comes in, the call gets routed to a, to a bot to a, a voice bot that hopefully can handle the call completely through automation. And, and if you've used Alexa or Google Home, you know, you can start to get the, the feel for how good these voice bots are getting at, at solving problems. So, um, but in a lot of cases, you know, the, the voice bot's not going to be able to handle the problem. Uh, the call would get transferred out to a live agent. And at that point, um, the media would be forked possibly by an SBC or some other device in the network, uh, to a, a gateway that can 
uh, can use AI services like speech to text and different different services to uh, provide analytics on the real time media that's happening within the call and surface insights to the live agents in real time to try to help them solve the problems more quickly. So that's you know in addition to that you can. Uh, you can also surface insights to a, a supervisor that's kind of looking across their, their contact center and trying to see trends going on. So um, I'm not going to get too much into the contact store side of this, but um, just quickly, you know, when the call comes in to a voice agent, it's collecting a lot of context about the call, and you want to be able to hand that off to an agent, just like a traditional IVR, really. So that's what that's all about. All right, so what is a voice agent? Um, a voice agent answers questions over the phone, basically. It's, it's kind of a Alexa, Google Home, but you're speaking to it through the telephone system, which has a different set of problems, really. Um, narrow band audio, things like that, are a little more challenging for speech-to-text engines. Uh, voice agents are a combination of, of AI services, and I'm going to drill on some of those. Uh, that understand natural language, extract temperament, emotions from the caller, uh, process unstructured data. Uh, and then there's this cognitive IVR, which is, I, I think, a bit different than a traditional IVR. Uh, it does things that a traditional IVR does, like connects to the VoIP network, or, but it also orchestrates AI services uh, and publishes AI-infused reports to track KPI. So there are differences, I think, in the kind of reporting that comes out of this type of IVR system. Uh, the services uh, that, that a voice bot uh, would use, an AI-infused voice bot, um, speech-to-text, you know, ASRs have been around for a while. Um, I, my view of the differences with, with a more AI-based voice bot is it has to handle more open dialogue. Uh, it's not as grammar driven, so it has to be really good at understanding speech and transcribing speech. Uh, text to speech, I, I think there's um, an emphasis to make these text to speech engines sound much more human than they do today. Um, it's, you see that with things like WaveNet and, and SSML helps a lot with that, but it's, there, there's really a push from the industry to, to make these things sound as human as possible. Uh, natural language classification, NLU, um, is an important service within these as well, uh, intent mapping. Uh, tone analysis, um, we're getting a lot more requests where customers want you to, to, to gain insights about how to handle a call from the tone of the caller, from maybe the caller's profile. Um, there's tools within uh, IBM and others have, have tools for for extracting tone out of, out of a caller, the way a caller's uh, talking and, and what they're saying. Uh, sentiment is more just positive, negative. Um, and then you have deep search, which, you know, I, I would say initially it's more about intent mapping and dialogue flow, but we're getting more and more people asking about, you know, okay, what if, what if I can't answer those questions with, you know, the 40 intents that I've trained my, my NLU engine on. What do I do then? Well, then you can turn to something like a deeper search engine, um, uh, something that can look at unstructured data and try to organize it and maybe surface something that would be helpful to the caller. Uh, we get more and more requests for things like that. Um, a cognitive IVR looks a lot like a regular IVR. The, you know, this shows a single turn in the conversation. Um, it orchestrates these AI services. It integrates. It's an integration point for CTI, call control reporting, and business logic. Uh, interfaces to the telephone network through, through SIP and RTP. So this is obviously a primarily a SIP and RTP play. Um, we do have customers that want to integrate with TDM, but we usually just gateway to SIP. It's it's the easiest way. Um, but a single turn in the conversation. So a caller asks a question. It gets streamed to a speech to text engine very similar to a traditional IVR. We get a text utterance back. Um, I would say one difference is, you know, this is an open-ended dialogue, so you don't always have grammars and context to feed to the speech engine. It's having to do transcription, basically, uh, just from, from, its, uh, from the, the inbound audio without much context. Um, that text string will get sent to a conversation engine of some kind. 
uh, Watson Assistant, Google Dialogflow are some examples. Um, a bit different than Voice XML. It's, it's much more uh, around natural language processing and tent mapping, and, and you can kind of build prescriptive dialogue flows once you understand the intent. But, but um, being able to jump around to different intents and handle uh, you know, multiple uh, um, different things coming in uh, within a single sentence, it might, um, I'll talk more about that in a minute. And then once we get the text response back, uh, we send it to text-to-speech, gets synthesized into audio, and gets streamed out to the caller, and that happens over and over again. So, you know, there's a lot more that goes on. You do have to deal with barge in. Uh, we do a lot around uh, being able to change the speech models and acoustic models on the fly within a conversation. So you might train your, your speech engine on a bunch of different models and be able to switch between those. There's lots of things you do in these flows that, that, that have to be done to make them make them go well. Um, you know, I want to just talk quickly about some of the interfaces that this Cognitive IVR supports. So, um, you know, obviously we connect on with SIP and RTP, various uh, voice sources on the left side. Um, in terms of speech, MRCP is kind of the standard around connecting to speech engines. Um, we also see WebSocket interfaces for Google speech and and uh, Poly, uh, Amazon Poly, as well as Watson Speech Services. So, um, you know, there's kind of a, a trend, I, I think, in that direction. Uh, and then all the AI services are typically REST-based. They're transactional-based uh, once you get out of the speech and real-time streaming uh, side of it. And then the, the KPIs and reporting, um, you know, they're traditional things like Splunk, but, you know, I, what we did was build our services in a cloud native way, and I'm going to talk more about that. And that brings other things like monitoring with uh, Prometheus and Elk stacks and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, I, I think as, as, as time goes on, you'll see these cognitive systems kind of become more cloud native. And, and that's a, an interesting area, I think, for VoIP applications to kind of see how that's going to play in the future. Um, just uh, quickly, some differences between uh, what I would call traditional IVR and a cognitive IVR. Um, it's debatable whether it's primarily DTMF driven, but certainly much more emphasis on DTMF uh, with traditional IVRs. Cognitive is primarily voice driven. Directed dialogue versus open dial open ended dialogue, grammar driven. Uh, cognitive IVRs are much more around uh, language and acoustic model training and and changing models throughout the call. Um, MRCP based, I already talked about that, versus cloud speech services like Google and Amazon. Um, you know, a lot of the speech side of this gets into language support too, which I'm not gonna get into, but there's no one company that has kind of a, a monopoly on this. I mean, depending on the region you're in, depending, uh, you know, Google might be great at one one language, IBM might be great at another. One might be better train, trainable. The other one might be better. Uh, you know, it, it just really depends on the language and the in the region. There's a lot of regional speech engines that we've been, um, you know, forced to to go on and integrate with because they're just much better than than the ones that uh, that IBM may have or Google or whoever. Um, so traditional KPIs versus AI-driven KPIs, I'll talk a little bit about that. And then traditional form factors versus cloud-native Dockerized workloads. Just a quick kind of a network diagram view of things. Um, you know, I wanted to show this because of the importance of this service orchestration uh, engine that sits in the middle. Uh, this is a pattern that we're seeing over and over again um, that provides uh, a lot of customization goes into these voice bots where you have to call out the third-party APIs at times and certainly orchestrate a lot of different AI services. Um, we have samples of these that are like available in open source They're, that can be written in whatever language they're dealing with, basically text input and text output. So there, um, there's a lot of things that go into building voice bots that really have a lot of automation built into them. Uh, so some of the challenges. Um, Already talked about understanding, you know, the, the challenges around speech, understanding dialects. Uh, you know, for us, acoustic model training is pretty critical in most of the, um, 
most of the uh, engagements we get involved in. You can do a lot with the base models. Google has a great base speech model, uh, but it's untrainable. So if you get into anything that's domain-specific language, you got to train it, um, dialects, things like that. It, it, again, depends on the language, but, but that's really important. Um, you know, our, our experience is single-syllable words, letters, alphanumeric letters, spelling is, is a challenge for a lot of these, these engines, but it's really important uh, to be able to, for a, autom a voice automation bot, to be able to, you know, take a spelled last name because it's not going to have that. It's not going to know how to, sp how to spell out a complicated last name or an address or something like that. Um, you know, obviously, speech processing is very, uh, it's CPU intensive. Um, voice authentication, it can be a challenge. We have a lot of customers asking us all the time about doing voice authentication. Voice biometrics is, is interesting. It can get you about 90, maybe 95 to 98 percent of the way there. Um, but it's got some flaws. So there's, you know, you get into two-factor authentication. Uh, we support uh, SMS combined with voice, which uh, is kind of an interesting area that a lot of, um, a lot of people are really interested in. Um, speech is mostly about sounding, sounding human. You know, if it, uh, we've gotten pushback from several customers when we present something that, that's just kind of out of the box and sounds too robotic. So there, there's this desire for people to, to talk to something that sounds human. They feel like, and it makes sense, that you can contain uh, people in the system longer if they feel like they're, they're communicating with something that, that's uh, at a different level than maybe a robotic kind of text-to-speech engine. Um, natural language understanding, um, collecting input from, from callers. You know, a, an example would be you call to order a pizza, and I want a large pizza with pepperoni, and, and, uh, and I want it delivered, and it's all delivered to this address, and somebody says that all in a single sentence. Well, how do you parse that out? You know, there's... That, that can be a challenge if, if it's not a very, if it's an open-ended dialogue. And, and there's tools within like Watson Assistant, I assume other dialogue, uh, um, other NLU engines to kind of handle that by extracting just different parts of, of the input from the caller and, and asking questions about the parts that are missing. Um, intent training. Uh, we start seeing a lot more as time goes on trying to create verticalized uh, intents for, for different industries so that peop, every customer that deploys, you know, one of the big things is how quick does it take you to create the voice bot? If you have to train the acoustic model, if you have to train all the intents, it can be a really time consuming thing to build these. So the more pre-built intents that we can provide, the, the better. And, that, and that's, that's an area that a lot of people are, are paying a lot more attention to. Same with acoustic model training. If you can train it if you're working in the uh, airline industry and you have a bot trained on a bunch of airline terms um, and the acoustic models are trained that way, it's, you're going to get much further, uh, much more rapidly uh, in building your voice bot out. Okay, so I'm going to switch gears and talk about agent assist a bit. Um, so agent assist rely on real-time audio to help live agents. It's really about... Uh, enabling live agents with AI to more rapidly uh, answer questions, basically. For, uh, you can also look at it as a way to surface insights across your, your contact center, but um, it's, it's interesting. Early on, you know, everybody was more interested in voice spots. What we're seeing now is, like, there are a lot of people really interested in this, um, being able to do agent assist, being able to... Um, sort of introduce AI into their, uh, into their contact center without going all in. So it kind of still leaves some of the control in their live agent's hands. You know, a lot of companies aren't ready to hand over their customer interactions to automation. Um, this gives people a way to kind of, you know, take a step into it without going fully in. Um, in terms of the AI services, um, you know, they, the AI services involve transcribe natural language. They map caller questions to intents and topics. Um, extract uh, agent temperament and emotions. That's really important. If you're if you're overseeing a hundred live agents, you know which of those agents is is 
not behaving well with the customers. It's really hard to, to figure that out. And with some of these tools, it's, that helps with training and things like that. Uh, you also need a voice gateway in this, something that can tap into live calls. And there's really not a lot of standards in this area. Um, uh, we're finding, you know, we're using different ways to do that. I'm going to talk a little bit about it, but it's, it's one of the challenges. You know, phone calls aren't really made to be tapped into. You know, it's a challenge. So uh, that's, that's an important part of it. So the AI services, speech to text, again, it's, you know, there's no grammar, no context at all here. You just have a live stream of audio coming in, and you're trying to transcribe it. So it's, again, the speech engines have to have really good, well-trained models uh, to handle, handle these kind of calls. Uh, natural language classification, intent mapping, um, again, uh, these are kind of short tell answers that you're trying to just you know, pick something out of what, what the caller said and give the, the live agent information. You know, we work with banking customers that maybe have 400 products, and to train a live agent on 400 products is pretty challenging. But if you can get to that product pretty quickly um, by what the caller said and surface that to a live agent, you can shorten these calls quite a bit. Uh, tone analysis, sentiment, I've talked about. Um, topic modeling is another important area of agent assist. You want to you want to be able to kind of model uh, what you expect out of your contact center and what you expect your live agents to be doing, and this is a way to kind of track that and, and see how successful they're being. On the voice agent side, so uh, it's a bridge basically into the AI services. It orchestrates them. It, it connects to the, uh, it taps into the phone calls. So, you know, one of the techniques we use is SIPREC. I don't know if people are familiar with SIPREC, but um, that's that we're having pretty good success there, but CIPREC is is not widespread. I'd say about 20% of the customers we talk to um, support CIPREC already, but maybe they they have to upgrade their system some to get more CIPREC connections or whatever. Um, I, what's great about CIPREC is you get two separate audio streams to your speech engine as opposed to something like uh, you know, tapping into a call through a uh, MCU or an SFU or something. Um, well, an MCU. If you're, if you're getting a mixed stream, you have to deal with how do I separate out the voices on that stream. And the speech engines support speaker diarization, but it's still hard to attach metadata to those streams and figure out who's talking. Is it the agent? Is it the customer? So CIPREC is, a, is an important way to do that. We're also looking at, by, by, you know, basically inserting a back-to-back -back user agent into the call flow and tapping out that way. If a customer is willing to do that, then that's another option for us to get into the call flow. Here's another network diagram that kind of shows what this looks like. You can see at the top the call between the live agent and, the, and this caller being uh, forked out from a session border controller. And then you know, through this voice gateway, it's orchestrating uh, some AI services and eventually publishing insights back to the customer. This is kind of a typical way that this works. So challenges, you know, tapping into phone calls, I already mis mentioned, is a big challenge with this. Uh, every customer's networks are different, and we're trying to figure out what the best methods, mo most reliable patterns are to do this. CIPREC seems to be Definitely one of the candidates, but we're we're going to have to support several. Um, there's uh, there's no way around it. Um, delivering insights in real time to an agent can be kind of a challenge because you have to map the metadata of uh, what who the agent is to the caller they're talking to to all the insights being surfaced. Um, scaling this up, you know, we're dealing a lot of times with contact centers that you know have thousands and thousands of concurrent calls going on and and. Scaling that up is a challenge. Um, speech to text, as I mentioned, uh, since this there is no context and grammar, you're just streaming uh, the audio into these uh, into these speech engines. So they have to be really good. You know, they don't have to be perfect. It's you know when you're trying to extract intents and things like that. As long as you can get the important words in those sentences, um, it's usually enough to surface the information. But it's still important. Uh, to be able to do that without a lot of context and grammar. Um, speaker separation, I mentioned, makes uh, the MCU approach is, I, I don't think, really a viable approach, but we do get asked about that sometimes. 
All right, so I'm just going to talk briefly about cloud native. Um, you know, IBM and personally, it's all about cloud native these days. So it's it's a hot topic. I, I think it's it's interesting because you know, VoIP applications. I, I'd be interested just to see if how many people are, are really looking at cloud native kind of approaches to building VoIP applications because. You know, we, we feel like that's kind of the future direction of things, M microservices, containers from development to production. So cloud native is, is really more than just how you build your applications. It kind of infuses all your processes and how you uh, deliver software end to end. Um, and and it, it's really changed, you know, over the years the way we develop software. And uh, it, it, it's, it's a pretty exciting trend, I think, but I, I think there's some challenges with VoIP applications and VoIP workloads, but um, you know, just to finish this out, consistent fabrics, multi-cloud, it makes th these applications very portable between on-premise. We we have a see a big trend where customers want to go to cloud, but they want to start on-premise before they migrate to a public cloud. So they might want to start with a private cloud and have those workloads built in a way that will just migrate out to the public cloud. And, and you get hybrid cloud situations where maybe, you know, they're accessing back-end systems on-premise, on, on but they're going out the cloud for some of the AI services. So, um, you know, we've got customers doing all of it, either all in cloud, uh, we're going to have solutions all on-premise or hybrid. They, it, all of them are viable, and, and we see them all. Um, so why cloud native? Faster code delivery, tighter control over what is being delivered. Yeah, it's massively yet dynamically scalable. End-to-end um, -end deployment pipeline and portability, all, all these are really important aspects to, to cloud native. So, you know, what enables cloud native? It's really about uh, containerized workloads, uh, Docker workloads and Kubernetes. Um, but some of the characteristics of that don't really lend themselves very well to VoIP, right? Stateless, immutable ephemeral containers, um, dynamically scalable, you know, Stateless doesn't really work for a VoIP app, right? You can't really spray RTP packets across a cluster. So that's one of the challenges we've run into. You know, all the everything we're delivering now is in the form of Docker containers, and we use Kubernetes both on-premise and in the cloud. But but we have to work around some of those limitations by um, by doing some things because SIP and RTP aren't natively supported by Kubernetes. Kubernetes is the orchestration framework for Docker. It's developed by Google. It's what AWS uses. It's what IBM uses. Um, it's basically the container uh, orchestration framework. And uh, you know, we when we deploy, we have to deploy in what's called host network mode, which basically means we just listen right on on the the core VM or the bare metal that we're running on for uh, for traffic. We can't really use the overlay Kubernetes network because it's not supported natively. SIP and RTP or are just not supported really by ingress load balancers. So I, I think this is a really interesting thing. If I was in research or working in that area, I'd be thinking about how to build something like an SBC for Kubernetes. You know, it's an ingress load balancer that can manage VoIP traffic across a containerized set of work uh, applications. Um, it's, it's missing and it, it's, uh, it, it needs to be there, I think, for, for for VoIP applications to kind of expand into this area. Um, so I think that's it. I, I don't really have time. I usually try to do demos in these, but um, there, this phone number, if you want to call this phone number, it, it, it is a uh, voice bot that we created that describes uh, the IBM Voice Gateway. Um, you, you can get an idea of kind of, this is just all base model stuff. We haven't really done a lot of work with this to, to make it, uh, we haven't trained the base engine or anything like that, but it, it'll give you an idea how it works. Um, and this was all built uh, using a voice agent, which is our SaaS offering. But that's it. Any questions? Yeah, Dean. I'll bring you the mic. Yeah, we got time for maybe one question. Uh, I saw one presentation recently which suggested feeding in um, web chat logs into the AI system for, for, for voice yeah. as well as yeah. a good source of material either generally or for a particular uh, person. Absolutely, yeah. So, so our speech engine at IBM, and I don't know about others, but 
you can train it on textual data or on acoustic data. Um, it's that would be a great choice for for textual to be able to take you know as much you know real interactions as you can feed it in. It helps train the language model. You can show the you know it, it's it's definitely one of the ways we train. In fact, um, when you build this out, and I I could have brought it up, but when you build these chat bots, um, one of the things a lot of people do is just extract all the responses from the chatbot engine and use that to train the speech engine immediately. It's another way to do it because it's all text, it's all domain relevant, and it helps to train the engine on the kinds of language that they're going to be seeing. So it's a good, really good point. Thank you very much, Brian. Okay. Thanks, everyone.